Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lance Young, Chief Eagle Wolf of the Namaskat Tribe, and I'm an advisor of the Partnership of Historic Bostons. And I want to thank you for joining us this morning for Dispossession of Indigenous People in Plymouth County by my friend, Dr. Jeremy Bangs. This, is a, this lecture is part of our 2022 fall series entitled The Power of Place, an Indigenous View of Land, Place, and Belonging in Early New England and Today. Before we begin, let me go over a few housekeeping things. As you know, this uh, event is being recorded. We'll have it up on our YouTube channel um, and you can take a look at that tomorrow and you can share that with, with other uh, friends and colleagues if you'd like. We hope you've enjoyed the series so far. All of the lectures that we've had in this series are also recorded in, on our YouTube channel and you can also find links to them on historicboston.org. At the end of this presentation, we will send you a survey. Um, we invite you and encourage you to please fill out that survey. It helps us determine planning and programming for upcoming lectures and series in the future. Also, the partnership is an all volunteer nonprofit organization and we rely on the generosity of our members and event attendees. So please consider making a contribution to us which you can do so over on the website or when you're registering for any of our lectures or events on Eventbrite. We have muted the audio for everyone for maximum benefit of all attendees. Dr. Banks will speak for about 50 minutes or so. If you have any questions or observations, you can put them in the chat function. You can type them as they come up or at the end of the presentation. I will then ask Dr. Bang to answer the questions in the order that they were received and as time permits. And with that, Dr. Jeremy Banks, PhD, Leiden University, 1976, has written over a dozen books about Plymouth Colony and the Pilgrims, including Indian Deeds, Land Transactions in Plymouth County, 1620 to 1691, 2002, revised in 2008, Strangers and Pilgrims, Travelers, Travelers and Sojourners, Leiden and the Foundations of Plymouth Plantation in 2009, New Light on an Old Colony, 2020, and Josiah Wampatuck and the Titicut Reserve of the Mattachesett, Massachusetts Tribe, Leiden American Pilgrim Museum, 2021. He is the director of the Leiden American Pilgrim Museum, which he founded in 1997. And previous to that, he was curator of the Leiden Pilgrim Document Center of the Leiden Municipal Archives, chief curator of Plymouth Plantation, visiting curator of the manuscripts at Pilgrim Hall Museum, a visiting distinguished professor of art history at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, Arizona State University. And he has published numerous volumes of transcripts, transcripts on Plymouth Colony court and town records, as well as numerous articles. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the fifth annual International Indigenous Peoples Cultural Conference in 2021 and in 2017 by royal decree, he was named a knight in the order of Arang Nasu. And with that, I give you my friend, Dr. Jeremy Bangs for dispossession of indigenous people in Plymouth County. Dr. Bangs. Thank you. I'm appreciative of the invitation to speak on a topic that has occupied my mind for several decades now. And finally, I think I might have something to say about it. Today, we look at Plymouth Colony through lenses of history and myth. Often our ideas of what happened there in the 17th century are such a mixture of fact, fable, and fantasy that disentangling the reality from fiction is difficult. I'm not, I'm hearing a sort of interruption sound. Is this coming clear yeah. on your end? Okay. Today, I'd like to approach the story from two or three different angles. And the first is the pilgrims' own shifting and growing awareness of the place where they began to settle in 1620. The point being that they had a growing and shifting perception of the world they were in we cannot just say, oh, the pilgrims did this, the pilgrims thought that, because it kept changing. Their voyage is preceded by study and discussion 
what they knew about. Uh, this is basically the geographical area with no knowledge of it all, but they learned about it from things like this map of the New World, the first published map of the New World. It's not particularly accurate, but it did give some idea that there was something there. And that came out in 1550. So less than a century earlier, this is what people knew about it. Uh, we understand the pilgrims as colonists. We have to know what, what motivated them and so forth. We have increasing information, so did they. And they did this by consulting books and talking to people who had traveled. Uh, when they were trying to decide where to go, they had conceived of a choice between Virginia and Guyana. And by consulting these books, um, they decided on Virginia instead of Guyana because they knew what people in Guyana looked like. They looked like this, according to the books. And they thought Virginia might be better. Oh, this is a well-known odd picture. The question is, how do we know that any of the pilgrims were familiar with it? Well, for one thing, the school that the pilgrim Edward Winslow attended had a copy of this in their library. The book is Sebastian Munster's Cosmographia. Not only did they have a copy when he was there, they still have that copy. So we can see the book that he knew when he was a schoolboy. But besides that, which is already out of date, there were new pamphlets from Sir Walter Raleigh's more recent trips to Guyana. And they used the same concept in illustrating the people who lived there. But there was the news of Sir Walter Raleigh with the true description of Guyana published in London in 1617. The pilgrims were already in Holland, so maybe they used the Dutch translation that came the same year. And they decided that it was too close down in Guiana, it was too close to Spanish presence, and they would be safer farther north. Besides the books that they used, we have access to documents. And a lot of documents had not been used, so it will give some idea of what they were like. Here's a pile of documents. These were Plymouth Colony records that had not been published until I started working on them. And half of the half of the documents from Plymouth Colony had been published but the project was interrupted by the Civil War. And so these did not get published. And it's hundreds of pages of material that looks like this. And uh, it's a document from the 4th of November, 1673, having to do with land from William Watuska McQuinn, who was the owner. I don't know how to enlarge this, but if you could enlarge it, you could easily read it, of course, if you could read it. But there's his signature with a mark and so forth, and he's selling land. And that brings up the question of how could one person, William Wittuskpaquin, own land if the current myth, myth that the Indians did not have a concept of land ownership was true? The answer to that is that myth is not true. And Plymouth Colony is rich in having extremely detailed and thorough records of who owned what land when they sold it to colonists. And they're in such detail that we know that in some cases, the discussion of the ownership was argued on the basis of heredity. There's one famous case where the where two groups of Indians were arguing as to who had the ownership rights to be the pe person to sell to the colony. And the argument was carried out by saying, my father had it from his father, he had it from his father. And it goes back six generations. Now, this is in 1666, I think. <clears throat> 
and six generations takes it well before contact with Europeans. So the concept of private ownership of specified parcels of land must go back before contact. Uh, that's borne out by many, many records of who owned what and how the discussions go. Uh, the pilgrims weren't aware of that in 1620, and they tried to get as much information as possible. They used the most recent publication, and that's John Smith's map. Looks very informative. It has Cape Cod. It has Plymouth. Plymouth is down here. It also has some places that don't exist, and Plymouth didn't really exist then. Plymouth and the Charles River and Cape Ann are the only names on this map that still are located in the same place geographically as they show up on the map. It's an interesting point that Smith must have come here and gone around into the into Plymouth, into Cape Cod Bay, which he named Stuart's Bay after the family of the King of England. But he clearly had not been to the other part of the Cape Cod coast. So that's left blank on the map. So this is the information that the pilgrims had. And if you don't know anything about what's in this part of the map, you just fill it with curly cues and put in a name here or there. And how about putting Cambridge up here? There wasn't any such Cambridge, but there's a name. What's interesting is that these imaginary names persist through a couple hundred years on maps in Europe, where people didn't know whether or not anything had changed from Smith's map. So the pilgrims took off, and this is a representation of the famous storm, storms that affected the ship going west to the New World. And another myth is that they were off course when they hit Cape Cod. It said, oh, they were blown off course by these storms because they'd intended to go south to Virginia. And some people realized that Virginia included the Hudson River. But what most people haven't noticed is that Cape Cod was perceived to be the closest point to Europe. But when there was a storm in the Mast broke, they thought maybe they'd go back. But luckily, one of the passengers or some of the passengers had brought a great screw, a great iron screw, and that's what this is. It was used to raise the mast. So in my museum, we have this, the Ryden American Pilgrim Museum, and it's one of the few places in the world, I guess, where for nine euros and 50 cents, you can find out what a great screw is. If you look at this map from 1619, you see that Cape Cod is the closest point to Europe. And you go there if you're going to go to the Hudson River, which is that. This map was use, using information from Dutch explorations. And it calls this Bacalaos, which is a word for cod. So we have an earlier reference to cod being there and Cape Cod, of course. But once they got to this part, they were outside of the area, as we all know, they were outside the area which the charter had had them to settle, which had been down here. So they got together and wrote what we now call the Mayflower Compact. And this is a representation of that signing the Mayflower Compact in sight of land, but before going on land, because they had not decided who would be in charge if they landed outside the chartered area. One of the things that's interesting about the Mayflower Compact is that it testifies to a very precise attitude towards living according to laws and 
because this is clearly important to them that they should all sign this and agree to live in a regulated way. We wonder how they treated the natives, the Indians. And the answer in Plymouth Colony records is that they treated the Indians as equal in law. So this had been a, this was a consequence of signing treaties by which the Indians were said to acknowledge the King of England as their superior sovereign. That meant to the pilgrims that the Indians had the right to fair and equal treatment in the courts. Well, that doesn't get over the fact that people have different concepts of what that might be, but it did show that the pilgrims were trying to apply English ideas of fair treatment before the court, at least in the early years. So there's a picture of the landing. You'll notice that I didn't include a rock in there. Pilgrims viewed the place they were going to as empty. They instead is devoid of all civil inhabitants, where there are only savage or brutish and brutish men, which range up and down little otherwise than the wild beasts of the same. A nice idea of what they thought they were getting into. They also said these people are cruel, barbarous, and most treacherous being most furious in their rage and merciless when they where they overcome. But it was answered that the Spanish were just as bad or could be worse and the pilgrims are getting away from the impending war in which the Spanish might conquer their place of refuge in the Netherlands. So they took off and they had hopes that things would be a lot easier than the worst fears of these really ruthless people. And one reason they thought that it might be better is that there was propaganda published that included images of life in Virginia, Virginia being everything from Canada to Florida. And all you had to do was go out and pick up a bird or two or pick, pick up a fish in the pond. Apparently, life would be easy in Virginia if you followed this particular picture of it. it might have been a surprise and it wasn't quite so easy. When we have the description of their first explorations, we have quite detailed accounts of running into Indian dwellings. And that's a picture of one, a sort of house that was described in great detail by Winslow in Mort's, what we now call Mort's Relation, a book published in 1622, gives us an extremely detailed view of a type of house that continued to be built into the 19th century and has been revived in the 20th century. Um, this one was built by Jeff Kalin about oh, 40 years ago. When the pilgrims got there, they discovered storage baskets with corn and they took it. They claimed in their own justification that they were planning to pay the person whose corn it was, but they marveled at the size of it. 36 great uh, goodly ears of corn, some yellow, some red, others mixed with blue. But they didn't say they had never seen corn before. They'd never seen corn that big before. Corn was being grown in Europe, and it's even in one of their herbal books that they owned. So if we look at the 1616 map, again, is a detail. And the place where they started was over here, and they first did their exploration. And we see a house on the edge of Cape Cod here. So that could be the uh, buildings or the area described 
where the pilgrims went across a burial and discovered the body of clearly a European who had been, who had been buried there. Now the computer's bouncing around a bit. The first winter was one in which half the colonists died. Interestingly, they didn't mention this fact in their first propaganda published the next year about how people should come over to join them. It was so wonderful. But in the first three months, people did die. And half of them died, in fact. But when we run into myths, we get a myth of the survival of the pilgrims by being helped out by the Wampanoag tribe, which saved them by helping them through the winter. Well, they didn't. The first meeting with Indians from the Poconoka tribe was in March 1621. And if you think about it, if half the people died and they had come with supplies, maybe skimpy supplies, but anyway, supplies enough for all of the colonists to get through to the first harvest, then there was a supply enough for those who survived in the first year. And what really happened was that the next year, another boatload came without any supplies. So the second year was difficult. And by that time, the colonists had made friends with some of the natives of the area, mostly from the Poconoka tribe. And there could be some talk of help there. But in the first year, there's a small amount of instructional help on how to how best to plant maize, and how to fertilize it. But from that, people have blown up the story into how the pilgrims are such fools that they didn't know how to farm, they couldn't fish, and they had to have help which the generous locals provided. So we're coming up with a, an imaginary situation and a lot of uh, honorable and dishonorable actions from different people. One of the interesting things about the first year in which so many people died is that it's understandable that the pilgrims didn't emphasize this because they thought that all of their existence was part of God's predestined plan. So even if they didn't understand it, even all these deaths must have some place in an expected plan worked out divinely in some level that is beyond their own comprehension. So in the spring, the pilgrims first made contact with various native tribes around them. And those are the Poconocets, the Nossets, the Namaskets, the Massachusetts, and eventually the Narragansetts. What's interesting is that the word Wampanoag doesn't appear. In fact, it is not found in the first couple generations of records about the pilgrims. It seems to be a name that has been growing in popular use or general use since the early 19th century when a play reached huge numbers of people and it was Metamora or the last of the Wampanoags which made a hero and a heroic story of the oppressed Wampanoags who were then victims of this invasion and that's underlying a lot of attitudes towards the whole story since then. But I think that it became the major name rather than the previous local names as Wampanoag being a general term. I think it became popular because it had a broad public appeal the last of the Mohicans preceded it, but then you have the last of the Wampanoags. And people were familiar with that. No longer is that play being performed, but we have that. <laughs>
Now, in the first meeting with leaders, there was an attempt at diplomatic formality. A green cloth was laid out. That was a sign of respect in Europe, in Leiden. And various forms, formal greetings were made when Masasoit Osama Quinn came with his followers. So here is a picture representing the Europeans trying to do a polite uh, recognition of the leaders near them. Now, oh, the descriptions we get given talk about the lands of Osama Kun as being perhaps almost as great or even greater than those of King James of England and Scotland. Oh, it turns out that it was inaccurate. But also, it shows the idea that these pilgrims wanted to express in England that a small group of virtuous Englishmen could establish themselves over huge lands for the benefit of England with little real trouble. They got on good friendly terms with the local inhabitants. We know that. A trumpet was brought. We know that all of these things were present and that it was the beginning of diplomatic exchanges. That resulted in a kind of mutual defense and treaty that lasted for, for about 50 years. So it is not a surprise when at the end of the first harvest, they joint meal was had, which is now considered the Thanksgiving. It has been denied that this is a Thanksgiving. The myth now is that, oh, it couldn't have been a Thanksgiving because it's not like later Thanksgivings in New England. Uh, I've explained elsewhere that it isn't like anything in England or anything like later New England, because the pilgrims were evidently trying to follow the instructions in the Bible on how to have a harvest feast. And so it lasted several days. I would typically say it lasted three days, but I reread that. And what the record says is that the Indians stayed for three days. And I think that the event lasted a week because all the other aspects of the event match the instructions in Deuteronomy. It should invite all the strangers within your bounds and various other details. So in the beginning with this kind of cooperation and so forth, the pilgrims were existing as a kind of gift of land from Massasoit to Samaquin. We have Plymouth right there. And the concept of the whole area being empty, which the pilgrims had, is expressed in this map. How unreal that concept was can be seen by comparing it with this. These are place names throughout what became Plymouth Colony. You can't have that many place names if it's empty. There are people living everywhere and they knew where they lived and they knew what the places were called. And we have these names still. Some of them are in use still and some of them are no longer in use. But Hocasset is still there. Mashpees, uh, Manamut, all of that, Kushnet, all of these places still continue to exist and contradict the idea that it was empty in any sense at all. Oh, if we look at where Plymouth was, 
and think about how insignificant it was. A map from 1779 clarifies that a little. This is the whole town of Plymouth, this little spot along the coast. It's very small. And that it expanded greatly since the early 70th century. If we compare this back, it's a tiny little point right there. And all the rest of this area is filled with people who are living their lives without needing to care very much about the odd people there. If we look at what the Europeans knew about it, this is a map of Cape Cod in 1630, where there were reports that had given all kinds of information back about the settlement and so forth. But it still has names from John Smith's map. There's a Bristol here. There isn't one really. We have Berwick here, which never did exist. Cape Cod is Bay, Bay is called Stewart's Bay, like on his map. There are three names for Cape Cod, Cape Cod, Milford Haven, and Stoughton Hook. Take your choice, the Dutch, the English, whatever that is, uh, that's from Smith's map. And they just kept on using these bits because map makers used old maps, not new exploration. So here we have the same thing, but indication that it was Osama Quinn who made this land available to the pilgrims because the people who had lived there had died in a an epidemic two years two years or so before the pilgrims arrived. Osama Quinn perceived that the strength of the European with their armament could stave off incursions from over here from the Narragansetts into his land, which is in this area. But when the pilgrims wanted to expand, they had to think of how to get more land. At the time, they were just finishing the first 10 years or so, a little bit less than 10 years of the colony. They had someone named Roger Williams staying in Plymouth. And while he was there, he wrote an essay now missing, in which he argued that the true owners, the proper owners of the land were the Indians. And we see from that time on that Plymouth Colony respected that concept. So when they went to get further land, they bought it from Chickatawba or Josiah's Wampatuck names the same, three generations actually the same family and his wife, Wapteniske, who sold to the colonists land at Situate, Marshfield, and Duxbury. Greens Harbor was the earliest name for Marshfield, so it changed its name in 1640. But going north from Plymouth and part of northern Plymouth itself, the land was owned by Josiah's Wampatuck. Going south, to the Manomet area and to Sandwich, the leader was Quakataset not Osama Quinn. So the idea that there's one big Wampanoag empire under Osama Quinn doesn't hold up to the actual documented activities of the time. Expansion was on this direction and then a little bit on to on the coast, but not much in the, in the lower part. So here we have the southern part of Taunton, 
acquired from Osama Quinn and Philip, his son. Seekonk Rehoboth, also from them. But Middleborough is from Tuspaquin and Josiah Swampatuck, different parts of it. So it isn't a matter of thinking of these places according to modern town boundaries. Um, land was acquired in Middleborough or in Taunton, but it doesn't mean that all of Taunton or all of Middleborough was bought at the same time from these people. Cotisets had sandwich, but Napoleon had land in Barnstable that was acquired then, and Yano in Yarmouth. So that takes us into the end of the 1640s, but you also see a boundary line here, 1641, which is set up to distinguish between Mass uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony here and Plymouth Colony. It was supposed to go straight west from here. And I think on modern maps, you'll see it goes a little bit south of west, south of west. And the reason for this is that there seems to have been a problem with the surveying equipment that one person owned and which was used for the surveying because we find that the same degree of error shows up in several things that he measured. Um, so it's kind of interesting that the entire straight line here is slightly off from what they thought they were going to do, which would have been more like that. Expansion included acquiring land from Matakwasan at East Ham and Bridgewater from Joris I. Swampatuck. So we're getting more bits of land from different people. And then finally, in the 1660s, we have Dartmouth acquired from Philip Metacom and Squamut, Sipakan from Watuchpo. That is the case where the generations of ownership are carried back six six generations before then, which would bring it long before contact. And we see that it's possible to separate generally the land that Wampatak, Tuspaquin, Osama Quinn, Philip, Karasat and Matakwasan had with these colors indicating the approximate locations. So that means that the pilgrims are dealing with at least three and more likely four or five different tribal groups. They're mixed together with intermarriage, but Wampatuck's land is quite distinct here. And Philip's land is like this, mixed some with Tuspaquin, the basket, and Kolkataset had a great deal of material throughout here, not across it and others there, but these are just the biggest names. And parts of the land here were owned by many different, um, might call them small holders. And the acquisition of land was not in large portions, maybe a little bit here, a little bit there. We'll see how that works, but it's interesting to compare this map with that map, which was put out a couple of years ago now, claiming that all of Cape Cod and everything north, even north of Boston to Cape Ann was so-called Wampanoag territory. Well, in fact, the line for Massachusetts territory is about like that. And how do you get past that problem? Well, you say that the Massachusetts didn't really exist as a separate tribe. That's what people from Mashpee have been saying the last couple of years, which is simply historically not true. And the reason we know that it was a separate place is that Osamaquin approached the pilgrims about a possible 
uprising in 1623, asking that they do something about it, which they did, namely Miles Standish went and murdered some people, but he did so on the word of Osamaquin that there was an intended uprising that would combine people from the Massachusetts tribes and the Nosset tribes and would then proceed to attack Plymouth and then Phil, uh, Osamaquin himself. So if those people had been subordinate to Osamaquin, he would not have gone to the Plymouth people to carry out the justice because there was an adequate and active native system of retribution and justice and punishments so that this is part of the treaty of mutual help and it indicates that the massachusetts group was not part of the group now calling itself wampanoags so this map from 2020 was supposedly the most thoroughly researched map ever of Native American land ownership, and it's really quite inadequate and does not represent familiarity with the documented ownership of land in the 17th century. Because you can look at the deeds that exist and say, oh, that's how they sold the land or lost the land. But if you look at it another way, you say, oh, here's who owned the land at this time and whatever happened to the land later these are the people who owned it at the time the record was made so the transaction is recorded but it also gives us complete insight into the concepts of land ownership that's what that huge pile of documents does in helping us out Where do we go from here? Well, taking a small detail on the outer part of Cape Cod, see that different sections have the names of different Indians who sold the different parts bit by bit when the colonists were trying to expand their settlements and get Nosset becoming East Ham, but this part in this part from Marquesa, Sahimus George, I don't know what his real name was. Marquesa is here, Samson is there, Sipson is there. Different things, different documents show that they owned particular pieces of this. And it is hard to justify the myth that nobody had a concept of land ownership when you have this detailed record of transactions. Now, this is what happened when the land was acquired by the colonists, divided up into lots and sold to different colonists. So that's from Marquesan and John Quasin also. And this is from Sibson is a different person. And there are other places where records show who owned what, who sold these parts. Now this kind of map exists for many, many places in the former Plymouth colony. So if you get down to the local level, find that the transition from ownership by Sachems to ownership by the colony and the distribution among colonists is very well documented and you can trace back the land and that becomes useful in some places where the land ought to be recognized as still belonging to Indians. So here we have a couple of records to show some of the documents that have to do with that part of Norfolk that we just looked at. And this is the mark of Matakwasan, Samson, another Indian I mentioned, 
Lieutenant Anthony is one. Um, I can't read them all. This should be bigger, but hundreds of pages of this give us all the information and that's published in my book, Indian Deeds, um, which is also available in paperback, but this is the first edition and there's several hundred pages of detailed descriptions of the land that Indians owned and exactly where it was and how it was defined going from this rock to that stream to various landmarks that could be used. Now, when we see the uh, You see the way that things were being sold. Sometimes people say, oh, they were being, the Indians were being fooled by the kind of goods that being used to trade. Now, I'd like to explain that a little bit. This is an adze that is used for woodworking. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a beautiful tool. And it fits my hand perfectly and it allows complete transfer of power from the arm into the blade. And it's just a perfect tool, but it takes a long time to use this to scrape out burned wood. It can be used to make bowls and all the way up to making canoes, making boats. It's from Plymouth, found on the surface in Plymouth. And this is very interesting because it is a kind of rock that isn't from Plymouth. It is a typical Midwest implement, the same kind of rock and the same kind of work is used for making ax heads, for making uh, several other tools, but particularly this adds and if it's in Plymouth, it meant that somebody was trading it as far away as Massachusetts is from, say, Illinois. Because that's where that sort of thing is found, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan. And that's a long way off. So there must have been some trade involved, a certain kind of expense. And this tool works better to do the same job. And this came from a similar great distance, thousands of miles from England or Holland. With this tool, you could do the work that the, that the ads would do much more quickly and effectively. It's not as beautiful a tool, but it'll do the job. And we have that kind of ax in many deeds. So along with hoes, so this hoe, the 70th century hoe, will turn the ground more safely, more securely than using the hip bone of a deer or something like that to make a hoe attached to a stick. Put this to a stick and you have a very effective agricultural tool. And in one of these deeds, it, exchanges with 12 hoes, 12 axes, some cloth and so forth. It wasn't a cheap trinket and was something that transformed agriculture and made it more possible to be efficient in doing the kinds of work that were essential to communal living and construction. So it was not a foolish kind of trade-off for some nice looking metal tool. It was getting the best modern equipment. And it overlooks the fact that the Indians 
became rapidly became uh, quite adept at using the new materials that they could acquire from the colonists. When you see a deed that exchanges land for these tools, then the question is, what else could they have used to buy the tools? Once the pilgrims were self-sufficient in growing their own food and could import whatever they wanted from ships coming from England, I can't think of much that the natives had to use for acquiring goods besides labor and land. So we see a loss of land and a decline of uh, an ability to use labor much. It's just not um, not a, a matter of trade. But we find simply that the Indians lacked anything that the pilgrims needed at, from about 1635 on, which makes it the acquisition of land that is the problem. Now, as the population increased, we have different places where people are trying to get more and more land. Now, here we have Puspaquan's land around Asawamsa Pond. He set up a donation to a woman named Aso, Aso Wem, that I can't read my own writing, also known as Betty, and that was set up in such a way as to prevent it going to anyone else. And this begins to show us that there was an awareness of the problem of the loss of land. So from the 1660s on, we find numerous cases where particular Indians made donations of land to their own families on conditions that made it impossible to sell or give away the land outside the descent from the original donor. Now, this was a concept that existed also in English law, so it wasn't out of the question. You had entailment of properties in England that only could go to the eldest son. In this case, we have several where an Indian wanted to make sure that it stayed in the family. In fact, quite a few that are discussed in that book and my other book. This book from 2020 has a chapter on Indian tribes and land. And I would read the last will of Numquit Numak in Cape Cod, left specified land at Wiscobs on Cape Cod to his son, Tequatchum Shum. If he will live upon it and improve it, to say farm it, but not sell it or exchange it or any way alienate it from my children. If he proved unwilling, the land was to go to Numquit Numak's son, William Numak. Quote, but not to dispose of it anyway from my family, etc. Now this is becomes more and more common as a way to try to prevent the total loss of land from families and from native use. On the part of the colonists also, there were some people who saw it as a problem that the loss of land was destroying native habits of living. Now, some colonists wanted to destroy it, others wanted to preserve it. We have a buildup of various bits of land being sold off around 
Mount Hope. So by 1574 or so, just before the outbreak of King Philip's War, all of the land and the waters here had been made inaccessible to Philip Metacom, whose lands were here. So we see him hemmed in and the buildup of tension just before the war, and that's described in book Indian Deeds. Now here we have Bocasa, which is another case entirely, but first we have the question of reserves, which is the final topic really. The colonists and the Indians wanted to set up land that would never be withdrawn from Indian possession. And the first, I think one, one of the first is the Mount Hope Reserve. And that's set up because it was going to be, it was considered the place for the Poconocet Indians. And it should never be taken away from them. Now it was confiscated after King Philip's War, but it was really set up for a permanent reserve as being the place it says here that it should be kept by them forever. Well, fine. And the next one was at Mashpee. Well, the, I think we skipped a, a map here somewhere. So I'm going to flip through and try to see it. Missing one. There. I had this in here, it's from 1648, because it shows two things besides using information from John Smith from 1616, but it also shows the South Sea, the Zauder Zay, and the North Sea, Mara del Norte here, which is Cape Cod Bay. That's Cape Cod, that's Cape Ann. Plymouth is in here. This is actually a rather thick idea of Cape Cod that's near Gansett Bay here, but what's interesting is that the South Sea is very distinctly this. And that's interesting because the Mashpee Reserve was set up for the South Sea Indians. And it is not another name for the Poconocets, contrary to a deposition by the people from Mashpee. But this land was set up from permanent reserve. The details are in my books, but they should never be considered anything but Indian land. And it's set up in such a way that legally it really should be. And this is the reserve that the Mashpee Indians ought to have, whereas they're trying to have a completely different reserve which we'll get to in a minute, the Titicut Reserve. So, freaking me out. This is uh, at Pocasa. I don't have time to go into that, but in the early 18th century, a reserve was set up there as a reward to Indians who had fought against Philip Metacom, and they were rewarded with a permanent reserve at Pocasset, which was only stolen from them, I think about 1908. And this map is from that year. I would say it should be studied because that ought to be returned and the work of James Sattel a biography of Chief George, uh, Chief, Chief Gray Fox, Edward Everett Page, 
who's the Pocasset, of the Pocasset Page Warriors from Fall River, explains how this happened. And this is what happened to the land once the non-Indians took over. Uh, it gets into questions of who's an Indian and questions of racism, because apparently it was possible to say as soon as you were mixing with Africans, you were no longer an Indian, which shows some kind of idea about Africans that doesn't hold up to anybody's uh, moral or historical lenses anymore. But there, here's a, a fourth reserve that is significant when we get back to Mashpee, that permanent Mashpee Indian territory. But they want this one, the Titicate Reserve, which was set up in 1664 to be permanently held by the Mattachesett, Massachusetts tribe who lived there. And they are not part of the Wampanoag group. So to claim that all Indians are subordinate to Mashpee Wampanoags is just historically indefensible. This one was set up with an extremely clever um, legal device. It was set up with a small board of trustees, we would say in modern terms. And they were to assign it to Indians to use and any one of them who might want to sell the land or give it away by the desire to do so, lost his position as a trustee. So any action taken by that person was not valid because it was not the action of a trustee. That means that the Titicut Reserve could never be divested, could never be dispossessed from Mattachesett, Massachusetts possession. So the Titicut Reserve, no matter who is controlling it, belongs to the Massachusetts and the Documentation of that is absolutely clear. Um, I've kept myself a little bit short. I don't have any idea what time it is, but I'll end with one last picture in, this, in the Titicut Reserve. I could go on for months on this. I did write some long books. If anyone has questions, maybe read the books first, but I would try to answer them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Banks. There's a lot, a lot there and a lot of things for 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 everyone to unpack. There are several questions here that uh, people have put in chat. So let me start with the first question that came from Dave Weed. Um, his question is, Dr. Banks, was there an effort to erase the use of the name Poconoke following King Philip's War and replace it with Wampanoag, um, though there was never a tribe by that name? The name Wampanoag is in my broad historical view, a relatively modern term, which can be usable as long as one keeps the awareness that each of the separate locations is its local tribe. There was no attempt to stop people from calling themselves Poconoket. I think it was the word Wampanoag became popular because it had recognition from the popular play that Jill Lepore called attention to some years ago in her book about King Philip's War. But I don't know of any attempt to forbid using any of the names. I think that the Poconoket name is very valuable to remember because that was really the group that Philip was in charge of. And no, nobody was trying to suppress that. But one of the interesting things is that the word Wampanoag first gets used to refer to Philip's men, and it meant not only from his family and tribe, but anyone who supported him. So it isn't really a tribal name in the early 
references of the late 17th century, which is when it first gets used, it refers to supporters of, of uh, Philip Metacom. So here's a question from um, Rob Green. His question is, what was the name of the ship that left from Deer Island to Ghana called? The name Wampanoag came from John Eliot as he adopted the praying Indians into his faith. This was the name passed down to the praying Indians because Eliot needed another name for the Indians that were adopted by him. Those Indians were sworn not to speak of their own religion when they were converted to Eliot's group and the name Wampanoag or Wampanoag became synonymous when the first book was written that had to do with King Philip's war. So I guess the question there is, do you know the name of the ship that left Deer Island um, to Ghana? I don't know the name of that ship and I'm not sure I'm familiar with the idea that underlies the rest of the assertions there because the word Wampanoag as I've explained in one of my books appears here and there not just started by one person but it is it is a word that's beginning to appear it's just not the major term at the time I don't think it's something where John Elliot was trying to invent a useful name so uh, here's a question from Anne. She wants to know, do you know what was the medium of payment for these land sales? I know you mentioned some of them being the tools, but were there other, other things that you could elaborate on? Well, it varies by the deeds and sometimes cloth was used. In a few cases we have specified that the colors should provide uh, timber prepared for constructing fences or whatever, just mostly tools, but sometimes cloth, uh, European cloth is mentioned. That's another one that's common. So it had to do with what the seller of the land wanted, which had to be matched by what did the colonists have. It's, it's a, uh, a fluid kind of exchange, but I don't know what, what that, uh, well, one of the documents, I'll, I'll see if I can pick it up, my might have it here. Kettles, oh, here's two brass kettles and one bushel of Indian corns, one, one transaction. So somebody wanted two brass kettles. Um, I, I don't have them all, but it, it varies, but I would say the cloth and tools are the major requirements. So Jan asked a question. I think the partnership partially answered this, but I, um, I'm i gonna ask it too. Does your book in, on Indian deeds include sale of land to Nickersons in the Chatham area? Oh, yes, a lot. Yeah, a, a great deal of the Nickerson thing is that, yeah. There's a compliment here from Ellen who says, I have your book, Indian Deeds. It's well-researched and I appreciate it very much. I wish this kind of documentation existed for all of the land throughout the Americas. I have heard that the documentation for Plymouth Colony is richer than what is preserved anywhere else. Of course, I don't know for sure, but it is extraordinary that so much can be learned from the records of that one place. Well, the absence of such records in Massachusetts Bay Colony reflects two things, I think. One is that uh, 
in Plymouth Colony, there was a respect for the Indians as owners of the land. In Massachusetts Bay Colony, we have clear indications that the colonial leaders were sort of not really believing that and were willing to draw up papers and so forth that they didn't care much about. But the other problem there is that there was a fire in the 1740s where major documents were destroyed in whatever the building was in Boston where they were housed. So we can't be sure they didn't have these things, but in Plymouth it's preserved. Now, an interesting question is, what form did the documents take that were used in the sale? And in one case only, we know the answer. The Bridgewater Purchase, which is for part of Bridgewater, exists in two copies, both of them original. One's in the Old Colony Historical Society, which I think is in Taunton, maybe. And the other one I discovered was in the collection in Pilgrim Hall Museum. And they're identical, which indicates that the seller and the buyer each received a copy. So the copy in Plymouth is probably the copy that went to the colony for its records. And the other one may have been Philip Medicom's own copy. But that suggests a, a very standard procedure where, like in a contract, each side got a copy of it and you could compare them later. But then there's hundreds of them that are missing. <laughs> so uh, a, a comment by uh, uh, John Jim Peters that you might want to com comment on. He says the native concept of land ownership was communal. It was held in harmony by the people. No one individual leader or otherwise had the right to convey it to the colonists. Uh, that is a modern myth. It's a very strongly held myth. I think you can tra track it back about 75 years, but not much beyond that. It's the use of, I would say it's the acquisition of concepts as part of the pan-Indian movement where people on the East Coast were getting information from farther West where a nomadic society was more likely to have a general concept of communal land use. But if you have an agricultural society or agriculture with hunting, then private property concepts could develop. Now there was no market in land. People did not buy and sell land, but it was held hereditarily and it was defined by um, boundaries that people understood. And even in the earliest records, it is said that the, the Sakhams knew the bounds of their lands um, exactly. So that is one of the most commonly held concepts, which I think is historically not borne out by any uh, records, when it only comes into sort of modern ideas which have to do with the romantic notions. So here's a question from, it's a um, um, pretty long swell from Michael Bosworth. I believe in your your where your book when your book leaves off, Medicom is left holding Jess Montop, Mount Hope, the pen, peninsula land. After Medicom's rebellion, King Philip's War, did the colonists just appropriate take over land without any remuneration to the natives? And if so, what was that the decision of Plymouth Colony or the Massachusetts Bay Colony or both? I'm not exactly sure to whom the questioner thinks reparations should be should have been paid, but the concept of confiscating the land was to pay for the costs of the war. And 
I don't think they believed that the owners of the land still existed if they weren't imprisoned or sent off in slavery in the Caribbean. But in other cases, the land was not confiscated because they knew that the particular Indians had not rebelled and they reconfirmed donations and sales that had been made before the war and did not just take the land. So it's complex, but there was no concept that somebody needed to be paid for this when they were trying to recover the costs of the war that the colonists did not understand as something that they had themselves contributed to. And the, the oh, one thing that I was going to say in my talk and forgot was that when I had the the map of the lands of Tuspequin around Asawamsit Pond, that's a very important place because Josiah Winslow invented the idea of confiscating land to pay for small debts even if the land had not been mortgaged. So William Watuskin owed I think 10 pounds or something, maybe seven pounds for a horse. And they confiscated all of his land in order to recover it, selling the land to get a small amount of what it was, the land was worth to, to cover this debt. Now, this was objected to by other people in the colony. He said, this is not legal, it was not mortgaged. But it became the pattern by which a small debt could be used as an excuse to grab land. And so that, that's the beginning of a very negative system of stealing land on pretext. Now, just after doing that, uh, Josiah Winslow made the famous statement that he could proudly say that all land had been either properly bought or given by natives to the colony when he had just invented a way to steal it. So that I, I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> confused as to why I left that out, but that was why the, the map was in there. That's an important change in attitudes towards land. It, took place at that, that particular place. So um, Jen had a question on the numbers that were on some of your map and, and her questions were, are the numbers the water depth? And if so, how did they determine that? The numbers who have- are, are, the, are they the water depth? No, they're the years uh, when the sales were made. Oh, there are no uh, depths, it's only the- uh, the year of an official sale, and that doesn't mean that all of the land of a modern town like Marshfield was acquired in a particular year, but that's when they began settling in place. So here's a question from Joyce. She says, setting aside the issue of land sales, was there then no overarching loose confeder confederation of tribes or bands in the Plymouth Cape Cod area, as there was in other parts of Eastern America? There were several uh, times when you can see that there are associations of different tribal groups, some of it familial, um, but it's not one single thing. We see that in the beginning, Massasoit Osamakwin says that he's a superior to, I think, about 30 or 32 particular places. And if we look into where are these places, it's possible to see that they all fit within the map that I drew. But at some points, people in Nosset are allied with him, and later they're not. So it's very fluid, and it's, it's nothing like a hereditary uh, kingship. It's difficult to avoid 
making modern patterns seem applicable to the 70th century, but I think it was quite clear that the uh, superiority of, of Philip Metacom was much less than that of his father over the groups around him. And when he wanted alliances, he looked, oddly enough, in previous terms, to the Narragansetts, who had been the enemies of his father. So that there's a shifting alliance going on, and it should be kept in mind that these are people like us. They are not just set down in one pattern, and that's it forever. If something changed, then the uh, alliance could change. Here's a question, another question from Michael Bosworth. He says, Lisa Brooks' book, Our Beloved Kin, follows the Squaw Sachem Witamo extensively. In your review of the deeds, did you come across much or anything about the land she had uh, she had pre preview over that she had uh, ownership over? Do you did you have any uh, information on on her and her tribe, which would have been the Patassets? Yes, her her position there was disputed by other Pocasset Indians, and that's documented in the book. So who, who was actually the appropriate owner there? And it, it's a very long and interesting um, argument going on about the land and whether or not she was the squaw sachem of that area or the pretended one, as they said at one point. Those are other Indians calling names. So there's there's a friction going on. I think you answered this question, but John John Morrison from the partnership said, "Are there equivalent volumes of deeds documentations on the Massachusetts Bay yeah. Company?" I think you said that most of them yeah, were. Right. I wish that there were, but I couldn't find any. Okay. There might be somewhere, but uh, I'm not very familiar with all of the records of Massachusetts the way I am with Plymouth Colony records. So we'll take one more question here and then the rest of them we'll try to have them answered and, and posted so that you can um, uh, you can take a look at them. Um, the question, another question here, are you familiar with the deeds of Hampton County? If so, how do the sources of it compare with the deeds of Plymouth County? There are degrees of familiarity of various things, and mine starts with this. Where's Hampton County? I don't even know where that is. So I have a very limited focus. Fair enough. Um, so I think there's several more questions here. What we'll try to do is we'll, we'll get Dr. Banks to uh, answer those questions and either we can send them out um, um, to everyone when we send the surveys out or we'll figure out how to post them. This has been a very engaging um, conversation. Dr. Bangs, I wanna thank you very much for your time and your attention to this. Um, I'm sure that a lot of questions have come up. Um, um, you, you illuminated a lot of things. You certainly uh, put some discussion with a lot of the issues around you know, the tribes and their relationships with the, uh, with the uh, uh, pilgrims. Um, and we do thank you greatly for that. I did want to mention before we leave here that we do have one um, additional presentation that will be coming up and that is on, um, you see it on your screen, it's on uh, Tuesday, October 18th. It is a Zoom, you can register at our events and it's, uh, uh, I believe this is the final uh, of our presentations for this series, A Place of Persistence, Eastern Pequot Reservation Archaeology. We certainly hope you'll come to see uh, Stephen Stillman um, and Natasha Gambrell uh, um, on the 18th at 7 p.m. and you can register at the link that you see. Um, and with that, um, I wanna thank you all, Dr. Bangs again, thank you for your time and for your energy and for your knowledge and for your commitment, um, we really appreciate that. Not since we all can't clap, we'll I'll get the clap for everybody in here. Um, and with that, I believe this is the end of this. Again, we will have this recorded, and it will be up on um, our YouTube channel.
Um, please, please fill out the survey when you get it. And we hope to see you all again soon on the 18th. Um, have a great uh, afternoon and happy Indigenous Peoples Day to all of my uh, Native brothers and sisters. Thank you.